Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, attendance sheet is being passed around. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the deliverable and leap motion devices. As I mentioned on Monday, this is a full class. I think some people have withdrawn, some people have joined. If you're joining us for the first time today, come up and see me at the end of class. I have a leap motion device for you. Um, some people may have dropped this class. If you know people that have dropped this class, please ask them to bring back their leap motion device. Forgot to mention that that last time. Um, let's see. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Deliverable 1. Uh, the reason why I assigned this on Monday uh, mainly is for you to get a feel for the expectations uh, in this course, to see whether this course is right for you and for us to see whether you're right for this course. So as I mentioned last time, please make sure to dive right in and get going. If you find this to be a little, uh, a little too challenging, this class might, be, might not be a good fit for, for you. Okay, uh, deliverable one. Um, who has managed to install the Leap SDK? Quite a few hands. Okay, that's good. Um, tell me about your installation headaches. Anyone still not able to install? Painful but successful. So far, so good. Yes. Um, mine worked on Python 3.5, 64 bit. So I rebuilt it and it okay. works now. Okay. So if anyone wants one, ah, very then nice. Also, like, rebuilt for 64 bit Python 3.5. What, what's your platform, Mac or PC? A PC. A PC. Okay. So um, let me know if you have things like that. Send me a link if you put it up on GitHub or wherever you put it on. I will put it up on Blackboard. So if you're really stuck, go and have a look at Blackboard. We'll put up everyone's solutions from the class, and hopefully we'll find your combination of platform and Python version uh, and so on. Some people in past years have found uh, that it helps to uninstall Python and install something like uh, Canopy or Anaconda. These are larger packages that contain Python and a whole bunch of Python packages. And I think both Canopy and Anaconda include all of the uh, all of the uh, all of the packages we're going to be using, except Leap Motion and I think Pygame. But we're not going to get to Pygame for a while. So if you really get stuck, try uninstalling Python and installing Canopy or uh, Anaconda. That might that might help. Any other questions or issues about installation? Yes. Well, I don't know if this installation. I made it down as far as punching in the code. Okay. And I got through the first section, and the little box came up with the dot in it. Okay, good. And I put in the. the so uh, that's part two with with the matplotlib visualization, where we have the moving black dot. Yeah, because yep. once I put in the second one, like the for loop. Okay. It it broke. It, like I I hit it, and it says syntax error. In it. Okay. So it so. It's the three point five. Okay, so as long as you've managed to install things and have things running and then run into problems, see what you can do if you're still stuck, go see the TA and they might help you help you out, right? So it takes a while to get used to these different packages and to get them to play nicely with each other. But for the moment, we're trying to make sure we get everyone over all the installation hurdles. So as long as you can plug in the lead motion device and run the visualizer, the visualizer that comes with it where you see your hands, that's that's ninety percent of the effort for deliverable one. Like the same visualizer you have there? No, it doesn't. Doesn't matter. It doesn't. Doesn't matter, right? So there's different versions of the hardware itself and the software. That that's all fine. That's good. Okay. Installation uh, is ninety percent of the battle in deliverable one. Okay. So. Uh, once you've got everything installed, just to refresh your memory about what we're doing, because this is going to be the cornerstone for all the programming you do in this course, we're trying to build a real-time interaction loop, a feedback loop between the human, the person who's looking at the screen and waving their hand over the lead motion device, and the computer, right? So here's a very simple human-computer interaction. Slightly different from those you've seen before because this is real time, right? The moment somebody moves their hand, they see their hand or they see the dot moving on the, the screen, right? So we're trying to establish this real time feedback loop and then we're going to complicate it as, as we go. Okay, uh, in deliverable one, this is going to be a little bit of a crash course in um, the leap motion software package. So I just wanted to sort of Step back for a moment and give you an overview for how the LEAF SDK works. 
you're going to be creating a data structure called controller, and this is your main software access point to all of the data coming off the Leap Motion device, right? As I told you last time, for most of you, at pretty much uh, 60 frames per second, it's grabbing uh, infrared light from the cameras and turning that into the XYZ coordinates of all the bones in your hand, right? So those coordinates are being in stored in data structures inside the Leap Motion SDK, and you're going to pull that data out of the controller class. So the way that all of the data in the Leap Motion SDK is organized is in a class hierarchy. Who knows what classes are? Who knows what a class hierarchy is? A couple people. Okay, pretty basic idea. You have this overall data structure or class called controller. That's at the top level of the hierarchy. Underneath or stored inside of controller are a number of frames. So it's step uh, 20A here. And this line of code grabs the current frame from controller. So as someone is waving their hand over the lead motion device, there are 60 frames per second arriving in the controller database. And whenever your code hits that line, it grabs the current frame from the lead motion device. Right? So far, so good. Unlike a camera, which would give you back a frame that's made up of 640 times whatever it is, pixels, right? You're not getting a matrix of red, green, and blue values or RGB values from a camera. Instead, what is stored inside of that frame is information about the hands, right? So once you have a frame, you've grabbed a frame, you now have this class or this data structure called frame. And inside of frame, you can pull out Hands. So hands is a list, and that list contains zero elements if there are no hands over the device at that point in time. That list contains one element if there is one hand over the device, and that uh, <coughs> list contains two elements if there are two hands over the device. Right? So at line 22B here, we're storing the first element in the hands, uh, in the hands list in hand. Which hand did we grab? The left or the right hand? It's not quite clear, right? This is part of the challenge of working with the lead motion device. We're grabbing the first hand, we're grabbing the first element in the list. Was that this hand and then the user did this? So it happens to grab the first hand that entered the lead motion field of view. Or maybe hands zero contains the most recent hand that entered the, the frame. These are the kinds of things that you're going to have to start to wrestle with when you start to manipulate the data you're pulling out of the lead motion uh, device. Right? Okay, so I'm just kind of walking you through the class hierarchy. There's pointers in here to the documentation. At the top level, we have controller. Under controller, there's a whole bunch of frames. You can grab the current frame. Inside frame are 0, 1, or 2 uh, hand data structures that contain information about the hand. You can kind of imagine where this is going. Inside hand, we can grab on line 23C there, we can grab a list called fingers. What do you think the length of that list is? How many elements are there going to be in that list when you pull it out of hand? Five, right? <laughs> Now, in this case, uh, fingers zero is all the information about the thumb, fingers one is about this, and fingers four is about the pinky finger. Right? Pretty, pretty straightforward. Let's keep going. There are ways to ask or pull out of the finger to ask for information just about the index finger. So on line 23E, we're grabbing information about just the index finger. Let's keep going. Inside the finger is another uh, list of bones. Uh, it, in um, your four fingers, you have three bones, uh, which are called phalanges. There's the proximal, which is the one that's closest to your palm, the middle, and the distal phalange. So we're grabbing the distal phalange, which is the bone in the tip of your index finger. We've grabbed that. In line 25B, we take that bone, and that bone has 
two joints associated with it. The previous joint, which is the joint that connects that bone to the bone previous to it, closer to the palm, and it also contains uh, it also contains a next joint, which is the joint that's next going away from your palm. So if this is my distal phalange and my index finger, this is the previous joint, and this is the next joint, which on line 25B here, I'm storing in a data structure called tip. So tip is now the XYZ position of the tip of the distal phalange in my index finger in the first hand that was returned by the current frame from the control leap motion controller. Right? That's the whole hierarchy. You can grab any data you want out of that hierarchy and manipulate it any way you want. Sound good? You'll notice that along the way in these deliverables there are ellipses or these three dots. So I don't give you all the code. You've got to go to the documentation and figure out what needs to go in those uh, ellipses. Okay. How many of you, uh, some of you mentioned you've already installed it and you've seen the visualizer um, produce a visualization of your hand. How many people have got that far? Most people. How many of you have snapped some video of that and put it up on YouTube? Couple people. Who have managed to finish part two, which is the moving dot? Couple people. Okay, so half of you are about uh, part way through. That's, that sounds pretty good. Okay, any other questions about uh, deliverable one before we hop back to lecture? Okay. Okay, so let's uh, have a look at uh, the schedule. Um, so we are, we are, there we go. Um, we're working our way through uh, lecture one, the overview, which we'll probably finish today, and we'll start in on uh, lecture two. Here's the assigned reading for today. So you, again, have a quiz that's due tonight at 11.59 p.m. When I get back to my office, I'll put it up. And the questions for the quiz for tonight will be drawn from uh, pages 35 through 41, and however much of lecture one and lecture two we get through today. All good? Okay. So obviously, again, we're working our way through a, an overview of the course, and we just, we just kind of started in on lecture one last time, and we just sort of talked about the history of computers, not seen from the point of view of computers, but from the point of view of the way in which people interact with computers, right? We've gone from plugging in wires and feeding in duck decks, uh, decks of punch cards to computers that are either sitting on the skin, near the skin, or under the skin, right? And that's completely changing the way we interact with technology, and that's what this course is all about. Okay, sorry, just a little bit more housekeeping. Um, we already know where the course home is. It's on Blackboard. I wanna talk a little bit about expectations. So what I expect from you is feedback. Um, at the beginning of every class, we'll take about five minutes to talk about deliverables and installation and conceptual issues and so on. Please feel free to speak up. Um, stop me if anything's unclear, ask questions. I expect some common sense, regular but not necessarily perfect attendance as I mentioned last time. Uh, this is a pretty programming intensive course uh, as I've reminded you, so uh, expect that. Again, remember to keep up with these deliverables as we go because they're cumulative. If you don't finish one one week, you're going to have to finish it the following week plus the new deliverable. You'll have quite a bit of room for creativity, so you'll be sort of following along the deliverables for the first 10 weeks. After that, you're, you're on your own to create your ASL educational software. A lot of self-learning in this course. If you don't know Python, teach yourself Python. If you don't know Matplotlib, teach yourself Matplotlib, and so on, right? There's this thing called the internet, this thing called Google. Go to Google, type in whatever you want to know about tutorial. You'll be able to find it. Okay, positive attitude, that's pretty straightforward. Okay. What you cannot expect from me or the TA is to show up at office hours with a laptop and say, my code is crashing, I don't know why. We don't know either. Okay, can't help you with that, I'm afraid. As I mentioned, you're on your own learning a programming language and installation, uh, uh, in installing software. If you're really stuck with installing stuff, go and see the TA and he may be able to help you. He may have a different platform and a different version of Python than you. He may or may not be able to, to help you. Okay, uh, what you can expect from me and from uh, the TA is help with general programming 
question. So I can't help you with buggy code, but we can talk about certain conceptual things, like we just talked about class hierarchies. We're going to make pretty extensive use of Python dictionaries. How many of people have worked with Python dictionaries before? Few people, some people not. If you haven't, go check out a tutorial on Python uh, dictionaries. Okay. Again, obviously, uh, there's a lot of information out there on the net. Uh, please feel free to ask questions about conceptual issues. There's a lot of, a lot of things that are going to come up that are purely conceptual. That's really what I'm here for. Um, interpersonal problems. Most of you are going to be working on your own, on your, on your uh, deliverables. Please feel free to help each other, but please do not adopt each other's code because, as I mentioned, at the end of 10 weeks, you'll be lost on how to use it to implement your educational software. Okay. Please feel free to ask me any questions to clarify about the deliverables uh, as we go. Most importantly, what you can expect from me is an emphasis on concepts rather than uh, tools. When, we, when I first launched this course, we were doing uh, Lego Mindstorms, so the little Lego robots in C. Now we're doing Leap Motion with Python. Five years from now, we'll be, doing, we'll be using completely different hardware and software. Most of you are computer science majors. You already have a good feel for how fast languages and technology comes into and out of fashion. So I'm going to try and focus more on the concepts about human-computer interaction because tools come and go. That being said, I'm going to mention a lot of different technology as we go, lots of different examples of hardware and software. Every single piece of hardware and software that I mention in this class, you should be thinking to yourself, why is this software or hardware being talked about? It will always be brought up as an example to illustrate an underlying concept, right? So make sure you understand the concept for which the technology is an example. And we'll see already a couple of, couple of those today. Okay. All right, so that's enough about logistics. Let's start in on HCI itself. So why are you here? Why am I here? Let's talk a little bit about why you might want to take an HCI class. Uh, first of all, it might be profitable for you in the not too distant future. This is a woefully inaccurate screenshot now. I think I took this about 10 years ago, but it's a good one. Um, top 10 jobs out there. Uh, 10 years ago, software engineer was number one. Go find your own. Uh, list of top jobs, software engineer or programmer will be somewhere at the top. Starting salary has also changed quite a bit in the last 10 years, but it's not bad. Software engineer is a good job, but even better than software engineer is someone who's a great coder who can also think carefully about the people that are going to be using that software. Most of the programming jobs where you're focusing on the guts of the code and not so much on the interface, those jobs are being outsourced beyond the shores of uh, the states. The coding jobs that are staying in the US and the ones that are kind of interesting are the ones that are mostly at the interface, where you, the code is being or the results of the code is being shown directly to the user. Right? So being a coder is good, but going into a job interview and demonstrating that you can code and also talk intelligently about who might use this software and how your software will respond to different kinds of people, that makes a big, big difference. Okay. Not quite as good as software engineer, but not bad is college professor. So number two. Okay. Not bad. All right. Why else might you want to do uh, HCI? This is a screenshot from the online version of the New York Times this past Friday. Uh, right up at the top of the front page is a blog and a visualization by Nick Strayer. Nick took this course three years ago uh, and has gone on and become very successful about taking data sets and coming up with very engaging graphics and interactive visualizations around that, that data set. A big part of HCI is creating good visualizations that present a lot of data uh, in a very intuitive manner. Right? One, of the, one of the most fundamental interactions we have with a lot of software is visual. Right? How can you communicate the most amount of information with the least amount of ink? That's something we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about in this course. Nick seems to have absorbed a lot of those lessons well, made it to the front page of the New York Times last Friday. Okay. Uh, other reasons why you might want to take HCI, again, following along on this theme of uh, visualization. 
We all know that there is a huge amount of data out there and there are news, there's new software coming out all the time that displays that information in new ways. And often a lot of that information is actionable, meaning it changes the way people see the world or it suggests new ideas that weren't there if you didn't have access to the data or the data was presented in tables and, and so on. Right? This is uh, Gapminder. You can go check this out, uh, gapminder.org. Um, we're going to draw a lot of, uh, this is going to be a running example throughout this course. Um, Hans Rosling, the architect behind Gapminder, is a genius in finding ways to communicate huge amounts of information with the least amount uh, of ink. Okay, let's talk about Gapminder for a moment. Gapminder is an interactive uh, data visualization tool. Here's a snapshot from one of the visualizations on there from a few years ago. This is plotting life expectancy in years on the vertical axis and income per capita uh, uh, income, income per capita in international dollars or GNP or GDP, it doesn't really matter, on the horizontal axis. So the vertical axis is basically plotting health and the, and the horizontal axis is basically plotting wealth. What do the dots represent? The circles. Population. Population of what? What does each the, circle here represent? Each country. Each country. Yes. What does a single dot here represent? Yes, from where? This is kind of, uh, kind of giving it away here. What is the big red circle? China. The medium yellow circle is the US. US. What's, what do you think the big blue dot is there, the big blue circle? How do you know? Sorry? Does it actually say there, India? Well, no, but it's the only like blue. It's the only like, oh, yes, that's right. Okay, that's, that's not a fair one there. Okay. <laughs> if, you know your, if you know your geography, and it might be hard to see from the back there, you should be able to guess which most of these circles are, at least the big circles, maybe not the small circles. What does the size of the circle represent? Population, right? How do you know that? This one, I think there's no key or legend that tells you that. Nothing on the screen that says size equals population. How do you know? What's that? Common sense, Common sense right? You have an expectation about that sort of thing, right? Population is, it is a physical thing, but it's also kind of an abstract thing, right? It's a number, and we tend to associate population or quantity with size. This is the first visual metaphor that we've discussed in this class. We're going to see a lot of visual metaphors. It would have been trivial to write code that would have represented larger population as a smaller circle. The smaller the circle, the bigger the population of that country. It seems ridiculous, right? Why would you, why would you do such a thing? Because you all have an expectation that more equals bigger somehow, right? It's again drawing on an expectation that, that we all have just based on experience with the real world, right? There's quite a few of you in this class that feels big. It feels like there's a lot of people here. Okay, that's one visual metaphor. There are a lot of other visual metaphors in this individual screenshot. What else is out there? Big equals large population. What else? Opacity. What is opacity representing here? Some of the circles are translucent and some of them are opaque. What does that mean? Again, there's no legend to tell you what you're supposed to focus on, right? So in this case here, I've clicked on China and United States, and I want to see something about those two countries. The other countries are still there, but they're translucent, right? I don't have to tell you that we're going to focus on China and the U.S. in a moment. You know it's coming, right? Again, an expectation. Opaqueness represents focus somehow, right? Again, an expectation that comes from your visual system. When you focus on something, it's at the center of your visual field, and it's very clear. 
right? There are also a lot of other things that are in your peripheral vision that you can still kind of see, but they're kind of blurry and they're not in focus, right? That is another uh, visual metaphor that's drawn from the way in which the human visual system works. It seems so obvious, why are we even talking about it, right? It's another visual metaphor that's meeting your expectations when you're trying to parse this visualization. All right, so size, translucency, what else? There's lots of them hidden in this figure. Change over time, right? So I've clicked on China and the United States. Uh, I clicked, uh, actually what I did is I took the slider bar back to 1975, clicked on China and the United States, and then drew the slider bar, uh, bar forward to 2004. And when I did, the circles moved and drew these two trajectories. So again, you could probably figure that out just by looking at this, this picture, more or less. What visual metaphors are hidden in the trajectories themselves? Trend lines? What do you mean by trend lines? Absolutely, right? So we can already see the shape of this trajectory and learn something about the history of these two countries relatively easily. Some of these circles are occluding others along the trajectory. Now, again, it's kind of cheating here because you can sort of see that 1975 corresponds to the dots in the lower left of their respective trajectories. Which one is 2004 in each of these two trajectories? The full one, right? Seems obvious. Why is it not the other way around? Imagine that this trend line had exactly the same shape but now 1975 was on the top and 2004 uh, in the intervening years were occluded. That would seem strange to you. Why would it seem strange to you? Possibly. That will, come, that will come up, but that's not the specific expectation that's being broken here. It's like they're stacked on top of each other, so the top one seems like the most recent. Why is the top one the most recent? Why isn't the top one the oldest one? The snapshot from 1975. Most relevant. Most relevant. OK, maybe so we're like, more interested in 2004 than 1975. Ah, I'm not going to stack from the bottom. Why, is why are you assuming that 1970, 1975 is on the bottom? It's not on the bottom, it's in the past, right? Okay. That, that is what happens mechanically, but why did you say that it's, it's, it sh it's on the bottom? It's not on the bottom, it's in the past. Co correct. So in this visualization, it's on the bottom. But if it wasn't, if it was reversed, so 1975 was on the top, and 2004 was receding and occluded, why might that seem strange? Um, it's, of lesser it's of lesser value or less important, and it's further from us, right? 2004 is closer to us than 1975 is to us. So there is a mental equivalence here between space and time, right? The further into the past away from us something is, at the further it, or the closer it is to the bottom. So here's a third visual metaphor that's drawing on, again, an expectation that we have because of the way we tend to think about space and time. Right? Things that are further in the past should be occluded, and things that are closer to us coming from the past towards the present it would make sense that they would be on the top. Imagine, it doesn't have this, but imagine that Gapminder also made predictions. So you had some machine learning algorithms that were running, they're trying to make predictions about the health and wealth of these countries going into the future. And it, try, it tried to show you the prediction by drawing, again, a trajectory like this. How would you stack your circles? Which circle would be front and which circle would be at the back? 
if we want to meet this expectation that most of us have, that space and time are kind of related in that way. Yes? It would make sense, right? So I'd, lo I'd want to see the prediction for China's health and wealth in 2017 to be at the top of the trajectory, and 2018 behind it, and 19 behind it, and 20 behind it, and so on, right? 2020 is further from us than 2017 is, and again, there's also this issue of importance, right? I might trust the machine learning algorithm's prediction about 2017 more than I'm going to I'm going to trust its prediction about 2020. Right? So again, these are all visual things, right? We're just looking at a static picture, but there's a lot that's built into this picture that's trying to support your expectations that you're bringing to your attempt to understand this image, perhaps without you realizing it. If things had been reversed and 75 was shown on the top and 2004 was shown on the back, you might find this frustrating or it might take you longer to try and understand what this visualization is trying to communicate to you. You may not know why you're frustrated, but it's because it's breaking one of your expectations that you've taken from the physical world and now applied to this visualization. Okay, we're going to see a lot more visual metaphors as we, as we go. Just for fun, here's one more screenshot from uh, Gapminder. Now we've just highlighted China. Same axis on the vertical axis, uh, life expectancy in years. So uh, health on the vertical axis. And now the horizontal axis is plotting uh, children per woman with one at the far left and 8.5 at the right. Here's another trajectory. Again, if a visualization is done well, and it's meeting all of your cognitive expectations, it should be relatively easy to see what this particular trend line is trying to communicate. What is it? What happened in China between 1960, down here, and 2004 in the top left? Absolutely, right? You can see that immediately, right? If I showed you a table of numbers, it would have taken longer to see that. But generally speaking, health has increased in China. But there was a big reversal in the number of children per woman. In what year? It's not labeled here. Nineteen sixty, sixty one, sixty two, sixty three, sixty four, sixty five. What happened in Ch what was the big news in China in the early nineteen sixties? Cultural revolution and close behind that. And they instituted a maximum children policy. One child policy, right? There it is. You can see it and you can judge for yourself the success of it, right? Something that is, again, not stated here, but if you know a little bit of your, your history, it immediately jumps out from the visualization. The point of this visualization is to think about what is the goal of the visualizer? What information are they trying to convey and make that very easy for it to pop out of the visualization? It seems kind of trivial here. It takes a lot of work to be able to come up with a good visualization that takes a lot of information. There is a lot of information in this picture here and presents the piece that's most important. Okay, so a big part of HCI is visualization. We all know that the, the data flood is upon us. There's more and more data out there. How do you communicate the structure hidden in that data to someone who may not be computationally savvy in a way that they can act on it, something that's important to them that they can then use? That's very important. Okay, last reason uh, why you might want to take this course is, as we all know, computers are now basically everywhere and they're on all the time, right? When I started with this class, when I started this class 10 years ago, nobody had one of these in their pocket. I would assume most of you have one in your pocket these, these days. Okay, so what happens as we move into the future and we keep threading more and more computational devices into the real world and they're on all the time and they're interacting with us in real time, not unlike the lead motion device, 
or your phone, which might be buzzing your pocket and telling you someone's texting you all the time, right? So human-computer interaction used to be you sit at your desk, you turn on your computer, you interact with some web pages or some software, you shut off the computer and you walk away, right? Now it's continuous and more or less all the time and everywhere. So here's my little cartoon to try and show you this. Uh, just a few short years ago, we had about 4 billion H's, people. A very small fraction of them had this new thing called a personal computer, C. Then a few years after that, a very few people had this new thing called a cell phone, which became the smartphone. Smartphones are now pretty much everywhere, right? Uh, this is again another uh, plot from Gapminder. Let me see if I can just increase this so you can see this better. So this is two plots, one snapshot of the state of the world in 2006 and another one in 2011. Again, we have life expectancy on both vertical axes and the horizontal axis in 2006 is number of personal computers per 100 people. And in the right-hand plot in 2011, it shows the number of cell phones per 100 people. What am I trying to communicate to you by putting these two visualizations together? Hopefully it's relatively obvious. More cell phones than computers even. I don't, we stopped in 2006 with computers, but as you probably know, in a lot of developing countries, they've piggybacked over computers and just gone straight to smartphones. If you pay close attention to the right-hand plot, you'll notice that for about half of the countries in the world, people have more than one cell phone. It seems kind of strange. Maybe they define cell phones as including iPads and iPods and so on. I'm not quite sure how to interpret that, that one. But whatever it is, most people uh, in most countries have at least one smartphone. Okay. Which changes, again, how people expect to interact with with technology. Okay, so as we go through this course, we're going to start our discussion about human-computer interaction with sort of more familiar uh, interactions like browsing web pages with computers. We'll move on to touch screens and cell phones and continuous real-time interaction. We'll then get into embedded devices. So obviously we're embedding more machines in the physical world that are stationary but sensing things in their immediate environment. So those are embedded devices. They're embedded in the physical world. And they can interact with people, computers, and phones that come into and out of their sphere of sensation. Finally, uh, we'll end the course by talking about robotics, uh, where a robot is like an embedded device. It's in the world. It's sensing the world in real time. But unlike an embedded device, a robot is able to move itself. Right? Drones are coming. Autonomous cars may or may not be coming. There's going to be some very interesting human-computer interactions with those kinds of technology. Okay. Um, just a reminder here again about uh, annotating the slides as we go. In this, uh, in lecture one here, um, there's no need to annotate, but when we move to lecture two, you might want to print out or bring the electronic version of the slides to annotate as we, as we go. Okay. Any questions about lecture one before we move on to lecture two? Okay, so I have hopefully have tried to motivate why, why you might want to be here. Let's start now with the very basics of HCI. Start at the, the top here. Um, if we want to try and define what the field of HCI is, it's about allowing, obviously, humans and computers to interact towards some common goal. So, a uh, human browses a web page or hovers their hand over a leap motion device because they want to do something. They're trying to accomplish something. The computer, in turn, is running some software, and that software is dictating what the computer is trying to do. Hopefully, those two goals match up in, in some way. Okay, so let's think about humans and computers for a moment. Um, humans and computers are similar in the sense that they both receive input, so I'm receiving visual input right now, 
cogitating a little bit and producing some output, which at the moment is mostly auditory output. You, in turn, are looking at me or the slides, uh, cogitating a little bit and producing output, which may be writing on, uh, on paper or on a touchpad, right? Pretty straightforward. Humans and computers take input, they cogitate or they process the information and produce output. This is all obviously a little bit tongue-in-cheek. That's more or less where the similarity ends. So let's start to now think about how they're different. So let's talk about the input and output devices that are available to uh, people and computers. We'll talk about it, and you can add this to the list as we, as we go. What input devices are available to you? Our sensors, sight, hearing, touch. All right, so the five senses, right? You have actually more than five senses. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and skin. What am I missing? Right, okay, so proprioception, right? What is the orientation of my body in, in space? This particular input device or this sensation that you have is very important for amputees that get a prosthetic arm, right? You need to think very carefully about what are your expectations when you don't see your arm, but you're sending, com you're sending commands to your muscle to move your arm. What happens if you don't get that proprioceptive information back from your artificial arm? All right, so five senses plus proprioception. What else are we missing? A little bit of human anatomy this morning. Sorry? Something with your heart. Okay, so we have a lot of internal sensors that tell us that everything's working inside. The most important internal sensor you have is nociception, which is pain. Hopefully that won't play too big a role in any interactions we're going to study in this class. Proprioception, pain. What else are we missing? We're at seven senses. When you spin around fast and then you stop and you get dizzy, you're messing with the eighth one. What's the eighth one that we're missing? Balance, equilibrium, the vestibular sense, right? The fluid in your inner ear that tells you how you're oriented relative to gravity. How do you think your phone knows to switch from portrait to land landscape as you move the phone? Your phone needs to know something about its orientation relative to, to gravity. Okay, so those eight senses more or less cover most of the information that you're receiving in real time from the physical world. What about your output devices? Hint, you only have one. What moves your mouth? Muscles. Muscles, right? So everything that you do to affect the world happens because of muscle contraction, right? Muscles pull on the larynx to produce sound, all movement, obviously, muscle-based, and so on. So again, just kind of tongue-in-cheek, you have eight input devices and one output device. Let's talk about computers, input and output devices. This list has expanded greatly in just the last few years. Two most common input devices. Mouse and keyboard, all right, that's easy. What else? What captures speech? Microphone, so keyboard, mouse, microphone, those three, in, three input devices. Camera, touch screen, that's a relatively new one. When I first taught this course in 2006, I had some slides saying, Imagine someday when you're able to touch the screen and sort of in, enter information through, through touch. That slide obviously doesn't exist anymore. Okay, things change really fast in HCI. Okay, where did we get to? Um, microphone, camera, USB inputs, sure, all the, all the different ports. Leap motion, which is also actually camera, right? It's two, I think it's two cameras together, which is then rapidly translated out of pixel intensities into 3D coordinates. What else? For those of you that have a smartphone with you, what is it sensing right now? Motion sensors? 
Yeah, exactly. Accelerometer is becoming increasingly important. Location. Location, GPS, right? It would be nice to have that as one of our input devices, right? Not, not quite yet. What else? Bluetooth, sure. Sure, why not, right? Anything that allows a computer to extract information from the world. Keyboard. Keyboards, all right, we already got that one. Sure, Wi-Fi, that's fine. Do we, do we get everything? What's coming? What input devices are on, are in development but aren't quite here yet? So a lot of wearable technology, which we'll talk about later, is again trying to sense proprioception. So if I'm a computational device that's being worn, how is the human moving? Can I get information about their movement? Sorry? Heat? Heat? Yep, that's, that's, that's definitely important for a computer to know. Virtual reality, yeah, absolutely. So if, if what does a VR technology need in order to function properly? This is, a, this is a good way to think about HCI. So if I'm wearing those uh, very fashionable goggles, what are those goggles sensing? What is the input devices in the goggles or on the goggles? Accelerometer. Accelerometer is very important, right? How is the head moving? That's important. Eye tracking. Where is the pupil in the eyes of the humans? Where are they looking inside the goggles? That's, that's important. Uh, again, it's not here yet, but what happens if I put on the goggles and start walking around? Right? Information about movement is, is pretty important. Okay, so we could keep adding to this list, but hopefully you get the point that this is growing. The moment you add a new input uh, modality to a computational device, like plugging leap motion into your computer, and suddenly you're getting 3D coordinates and a whole bunch of them in real time, what can you do with that new input device? That's part of the fun and creativity of, of HCI. Output devices. What's the number one output device of most computers? The screen, right? Why? Why is the screen still the dominant way in which computers communicate information to us. Absolutely, right? So primates, including this primate species, our primary modality is vision, right? We've evolved to collect most of the information from the world through our visual sense. Okay, I think we're out of time for today, so annotate uh, this list and think about how humans and computers use their input and output devices differently. And we'll start with that on Friday. You have a quiz due tonight, and if you haven't already, get started on Deliverable 1. If anybody needs a Leap Motion device, come and see me. Thank you.